the recording and thank you again for that reminder. So we're looking at uh, measures of position. So again, we're skipping the frequency table stuff for now. And we'll come back to that um, once, I, once I figure out all the bits and pieces. So the, the statement here, every score can be represented in terms of standard deviations away from the mean, right? So it's a, it's a kind of a weird thing to talk about because the standard deviation talks about the measure of spread, but now I'm, uh, I'm talking about it as if it's a measurement itself. Right, so like inches and feet and stuff along those lines. So that 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 kind of ups the ante on the importance of the standard deviation. You know, like if it's not just a comparable value, you know, it, it's something that you're looking at as all right. Not only can I can I compare two numbers in terms of or two data sets in terms of how spread out they are, but now. I can measure things in terms of their standard deviation. That that that's um, as they say a game changer, right? So, if we look at back to example one, we had a standard deviation of two point seven six nine. All right, two point seven six nine is now the the ruler. They the, uh, we'd say the ruler by which the uh, uh, units of data would be measured. All right, so what I'm gonna do here, so I just put images of rulers in there because I'm so creative. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put in a zero. Uh, I'll put the zero in the middle and I'll make each one of these a standard deviation. All right, so zero, one, S, two, S. I'm only gonna go out two standard deviations in each direction for now, all right? Because it's really just a matter of kind of proving the point, right? So, so that's one S and two S. So, just accentuate the quality of the S, so that later on, when you're re reviewing your own notes, that it, you look at that and you say that that that's an S, not a five. Because I've had a number of people in the past that can't read their own handwriting, so I'm going to try to make it make it a little bit better. Because I know a lot of people are looking at my notes. Kind of, I guess. Well, the, the, this one's better than that one. Uh, but I've had a number of people that would say, all right, I understood everything. Where the 15, 25, and, and, and so on come from, all right? So that, that's, that's part of it. But if we can kind of just with a little bit of penmanship, you know, come up with that uh, answer on our own, that, that's probably for the best, all right? So just making it a little bit bigger so it's a little bit easier to see. Uh, actually, yeah, it's fine. All right, so this should be negative two, and this is negative one. All right, script S if you want. I, I don't know, just some way to remind yourself that it's an S. All right, so that middle one would really be zero S, but zero times anything is zero. All right? So I'm still going to leave that as zero. Now we're going to revisit. Example one, where S, or quality S, was, I already forgot, 2.769. 2 All right, so we're starting off at zero. I'm gonna take one of those standard deviations. So one of those 2.769s and add it to zero. So that's going to give me 2.769. I'm going to take one of those standard deviations, one of those 2.769s, and subtract it or multiply it by negative one and add it to zero, but subtract it from zero. So negative 2.769. For 2s, I'm going to take two of those 2.769s and add it to zero. So right here, I'm just going to jot it down. Okay, and so we just need to know what double this number is. So 1538, so 5.5. Five 
538. Five, three, eight, yeah. All right, so that's going to make this number 5.538. And this number negative 5.538. All right. So aside from spacing, the reason why I only went out for uh, two standard deviations is because we create what's called the usual interval based off of two standard deviations beyond the mean. All right. So this is two standard deviations. And so what we do is we just call these the usual, or we call it the usual interval. So I'm just going to tuck that in here, usual interval. All right. So I know okay, it's, I'm zooming in, zooming out. It's really small now, but um, you'll have the ability, to, if you're referring to my notes, you'll have the ability to zoom in and out also. So that's. That's why I don't feel too, too terrible about it. The second ruler is there for the frequency table example, which we're not going to do right now. So we're going to leave that one blank, right? What this tells us, it, it gives us a nice conclusion. It tells us specifically that if any number in the data set falls outside of an interval based off of these numbers, then what we'd be looking at is, is a set of unusual values. All right, so that that's pretty important information. It's a little bit beyond what we're going to do now, but it's a little bit of a, a taste of what's to come. All right, and so we're taking steps, but those steps from zero are not like one foot, two foot, three feet, or one foot, two feet, three feet, four feet, and so on. It's one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, four standard deviations. So definitely more syllables, but it's still the same concept. It's just like if I were to tell you that you need to take um, five, five mans forward. You'd be like, okay, all right, five mans forward. Well, what's a man? Right? I, I tell you that a man is... 20 bleus. Well, what's a bleu? You know, and then I define that, and, and, and you come up with a whole scale based off of that. that. That's kind of along the lines of what's happening here, except, you know, like we're, we're trained to think of things as inches and feet and miles. If I tell you to take, you know, move five miles forward, you're going to say no. If I tell you to take five steps forward, you, you'll be like, okay, how big are the steps? One foot a pop? All right, I can handle that. You know, so it, that's what's happening here, except uh, we're changing what a step is defined as based off of whatever the standard deviation is. When the standard deviation varies depending on the data set, all right? So each standard deviation, each data set will have its own standard deviation and each standard deviations, uh, each data set standard deviation will create a unique ruler or unique measuring system, which then can be applied to all the data within that set, right? So crazy stuff, but very meaningful stuff. The whole purpose behind this is to be able to standardize, right? And the classic example has to do with uh, students performing in class, per, you know, performance on assessments. If I tell you that I just got a 70 on a, on a unit test, you know, and, I've, and I'm walking around, you know, standing tall, feeling good about myself. And you're like, well, what are you bragging about? You get a 70 on a test. And they, they would say, I got a 90. I'm like, oh, good for you. But everybody else in my class failed. So my 70, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the king of the hill here. You know, and how did everybody else do in your class? Well, they all got 95s. Oh, well, you're like the worst in your class. Now, it's not going to make me feel any better when I get my GPA, but in terms of difficulty of the course, the environment, that's a different story. And, you know, and, and you can think about real life examples. You know, if you're, um, 
you know, I, I, I tend to think in terms of sports, but you can, you can think of it in a, a variety of different ways, but you know, like a minor league baseball player, you know, they didn't make it to the, the, the major leagues. They're not playing for the Yankees or the Mets, right? They're playing for the, the, the level down from there and they're, they're getting home run after home run. They're, they're the, like the greatest thing ever. And then they come up to the Yankees or the Mets and they're just okay. Right? Because the, the level of competition has changed, but they still are who they are. So their position on the ruler changes because of who they are and, and what they're comparing themselves to. Right? Um, it also applies for like a level change in a course. If you're thinking about you know way back when, uh, maybe last year, maybe a decade ago, when you're in high school or middle school, if you're in a, a, a regular level course, and you're like, oh, you know, I'm doing pretty good in this. I'm getting like high 90s. Let me let me try that honors course. And then you get into that honors course and you're only getting 70s. And you're like, dang it, that didn't work. You know, it's because based off of the competition, you know, your your position on the ruler varies. All right. That's all, that's all this is talking about. All right. So our, who we are, what we are, stays the same. It's just where we fall on the ruler on the scale is going to vary. Now, in this example, I kind of, I, I took example one and I just took the standard deviation, but if the mean is zero, uh, that, that gives you one set of outcomes. If the mean is something like four, that gives you something else. So I'm, I'm only giving you like the bare bones of it right now. But this leads us to something called the empirical rule, right? Because the empirical rule drives what's known as a normal distribution or the bell-shaped distribution. So if you've ever heard the term, the bell curve, you know, that, that's what we're talking about here, but this is the mathematics behind it, right? So if you fall along a bell curve, you're, that just means that you're following what probability says that you should be following, right? This is, what, this is naturally what should be the case. What we want to do is destroy, like as, a, as students in a class, we want to kind of destroy or move that, that normal distribution so that it becomes what's known as a skewed distribution, all right? We don't want it to be perfectly symmetrical where the, the equal number of people will fail as pass. We don't want that. We want everybody to pass. And, you know, yeah, we want it to be tough to get a really, really good grade. We want you to work for that, but we don't, we don't want it to be equally symmetrical on either side, all right? But this, Distribution is what nature dictates should happen if there is no outside interference, all right? And that tells us that about 68% of the data is going to lie within one standard deviation on that ruler of the mean, right? 95% will lie within two standard deviations, and 997 will lie within three standard deviations, all right? So we define approximately to be give or take 2%, all right? And also a little notation here, we tend to say approximately normal distribution in reality, perfection doesn't really exist. Uh, doesn't really doesn't exist. That's a typo for somebody, go get it. Um, so to expect a distribution of data to be perfectly normal is unrealistic, right? Um, it's just not possible. It's the perfection theoretical math is uh, the absence of outside influences in physical, uh, the physical world. It's all, you know, academic. You know, if you ever hear the, the term, it's all academic. You know, that, that's because they're assuming that none of the physical um, phenomenon that exists would actually interfere with whatever, whatever the study is. You know, it's like uh, if you're in a physics class and they say, um, you know, an object's thrown into the air and, you know, it, it, it's being thrown up with a velocity of uh, 20 uh, feet per second. Uh, pretend, and they always say this, like, ignore friction uh, due to air resistance and stuff like that. Well, so, you know, I'm going to ignore that on paper, but there is air resistance, so that's going to impact things, right? So we want to tackle a problem here, but what I want to do is I want to steal the work or I really just steal the data and the answer from number one. So I'm just going to jot these values down because it's not a whole heck of a lot. So two, three, six, three, six, eight, zero. All 
I actually remembered it. Look at that. Uh, so these are the, the data points. So we're going to disregard this example here for now. Um, I could put the X through it because I can easily get rid of the X as you just saw. But these are the data points that we're going to work with. And also it's going to save us a little bit of time because why not? Right, so we know that the mean was equal to four and the standard deviation was 2.769. You know what? I'll take this as a typo also. This example, I think it's probably better just as a time saver to be what I just wrote down rather than what was typed there. So if somebody wants to submit that one for a typo, typo bonus point, I'll take that also. All right. So what we're going to do is find one standard deviation, based on that ruler business that I was talking about before, one standard deviation of the mean, right? And what that is symbolically, and it's up to you if you want to follow the symbolism of this, but one standard deviation of the mean boils down to a relatively straightforward computation and that is X bar plus or minus one times S. Now you might just say, okay, well, that's the same as X bar plus or minus S. And that's fine. I'm just really I'm putting the one in there to show the relationship between the formula and the rule. All right. So it's more for note taking purposes than anything else. All right. So X bar plus or minus means that you're doing two calculations. One is the subtraction and the other is an addition. So I'm taking the four, all right? The mean is established to be four. I'll use my highlighter here. So we know that this mean is four plus or minus one times, and I'll go green for those keeping score at home, uh, 2.769. All right, so we just got to run the numbers. So four plus or minus 2.769. So it's two, again, two separate calculations. One is the minus. Um, that's gonna look a little messy, so I'm just gonna do it. But that's gonna be one point Two, three, one. Hopefully, I mean, I just did that in my head, so this is dangerous territory. I sure I really should get a calculator out, but I'm just too lazy to do it. Uh, the other one's easier because you're just adding it to the, the four, so 6.769. All right, so the big question here, and, and you know, it takes a little getting used to the computations, but once you get, get a handle on that, the biggest question here is gonna be, all right, now what do I do with this information? You know, like, it's glad, I'm glad that we have this, but what, what does it mean, you know? And I'll get to that, but for now, I, I wanna get the skill down, right? So, I'm gonna move this over a little bit because I hadn't planned on having a box take, uh, a, a table of values take up a lot of space. So I'm just gonna shunt this over, move this over. I'll try not to cheat too much with the copy paste function and stuff like that. Try to put myself in your shoes a little bit. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So everything outside the uh, one, or sorry, so everything outside of plus one standard deviation and one beneath standard deviation is an outlier? Uh, two standard deviations. Oh, two, okay. Right. All right, so 
that that's so that's going to be our next our next calculation. Oh, sorry, and it's not an outlier; it's an unusual value. Oh, so then, oh, okay, and an outlier is like something else, like a few weeks ago that we did. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. What was this called? What'd you call like an unusual number? Unusual, unusual values. Um, okay. But we're going to create an unusual interval or a usual and a usual interval to determine unusual values. All right. So the next computation is x bar plus or minus two s, two times s. And you can see it's got the same basic framework. You just got to, you got to carry out a different operation, right? So four plus or minus two times 2.769. And we've actually already, you know, the, the two times part, we've already carried out that operation. So you can kind of, kind of cheat a little bit and take our work from above. We said that that was 5.538. Uh, a little time saver. Of course, if you're doing this on a calculator, you can save a lot more time. All right. So when you carry out, so we're carrying out the subtraction first, and then we do the addition. Right. We always want the lower number to come before the the higher number. Right. So we're looking at negative one point five three eight. comma, 9.538. Yeah. Okay, I just want to clarify because my brain is like scrambled right now. Yeah. Scrambled brain. Nice. <laughs> That's not your fault. <laughs> so for the first standard deviation, we did plus and minus of the one times 2.769. But for the two standard deviations, we plus one of them and we minus an, a different one, the second one. So we're, we're adding and subtracting the same numbers. The result of this computation gives us the numbers that we're adding and subtracting. So what the first step, you know, like the only difference between the two computations is that we're multiplying the S by two now instead of by one. So here we're taking the four and subtracting from it the 5.538 and then taking the four and adding to it the 5.538. So we're getting at that 5.538 before we start the addition and subtraction. That's the key to this part of the process. Okay, I, I just got it, it just clicked. I'm no longer nice. standard, got it. Nice. Where does the one come from that you multiply the 2.769 by? Does that just mean one standard deviation? Exactamundo. So okay, in the thanks. second computation we had two and now we're gonna have three. That's where we're getting those numbers from. So you see in the, the next one, it's x bar plus or minus three times s. And so I'm gonna get my calculator out because now I, I feel like I feel like I just have to. Yeah, I've been looking up how to do a frequency his, uh, distribution on the, um, what you call it, because it's just bothering me that it's not working. So anyway. Oh, I need to get this over so I can actually see it. Uh, three, and it's in the frame grid. So three times 2.769, get that value, it's uh, eight and change, so 8.307. So we're looking at four plus or minus 8. Point, oh, I should show the intermediate step. Uh, three times 2. Seven six nine, which 
in turn gives us when we carry out the computation. Uh, we'll go with that color. And that's where we get four plus or minus 8.307, which gives us negative 4.307. And then 12.307. Uh, close bracket. All right, so, you know, it's, it's the same as saying 4 minus, I'll show it here, 8.307. And then the same deal just with a plus sign. So 4 plus 8.307. Ah, uh, 307, Christ almighty. 4 plus 8.307. So let me get rid of this uh, bad value there. So that, that's that's all those calculations are. And you could, uh, with Desmos, a uh, graphing calculator, a uh, TI graphing calculator, whatever, you can, you can do it all in one shot if you want. You don't have to break it up like this. I was just doing it this way so we can at least see, you know, a little bit of the mechanics of it, but you know, it's computation, so I leave that up to you. All right, so again, we're still, we're still at the point, or we're getting to the point where we need to say, okay, well, we did all this work, that's great. What did, what did it get us, all right? So with that in mind, what I would then do is go back to my original data set, and I, you know, luxury of copy paste here, uh, assuming I use my pen, so. I'm just going to jot it down below. So the x values, again, you know, get a little spacing, a little clean up the spacing here a little bit. Just a little bit, All right? So what we have is really a, 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 like I said, a ruler or a number line or you know just a, a scale, however you want to describe it, but. I'm just asking myself whether or not these values fall in these intervals, right? So uh, some of us don't need to do this additional step that I'm going to show you, but if it, if it helps, then, then do it. Uh, but I'll leave it up to you whether or not you actually want to do this step, right? So I'm going to create a number line, and I'm going to put... Uh, let's do zero. I just want to make sure that we don't have any crazy values. Zero, two, four, six, eight, and ten. All right, because I want to have an, an interval that's going to account for all the numbers that I have for x, and also the the interval that I just developed for uh, one standard deviation of the mean. All right, so. This is really just going to talk about the theory. So it's up to you whether you want to actually do it this way. Uh, most people are fine with just counting, but th this is what's happening. So I'm looking at, I'll start with the number two. I'm looking at the number two, and I'm asking myself, does the number two fall in that interval that I created with one S? of the mean, so x bar plus or minus one s. So I'm just working with that first set of computations, right? So then the answer to that is, okay, well, maybe let's take a look. So let me estimate where 1.231 would be. Make that a little thinner. A lot thinner. And estimate where 6.769 is. So it's like right about, meh. I mean, probably not, but that's where I'm putting it. All right. So in between these two values is one standard deviation about the mean. All right. So that, that's my the, the area that I'm focusing on. And so I'm going to ask myself, okay, well, does two fall in that, that cordoned off area? Yeah. All right. So then I would ask, does, is the number three going to fall in there? And I could even plot them. And I'll do it with a uh, black mark here. 
the two will fall in there. Does the three? Yeah. Does the six? Yeah. Does the three? Well, I got a second three. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it is a three. I got a second three, so I'll just plot it above the first one. Uh, what about a second six? Sure, that falls in there. So all of these values, three, six, three, six, they're all falling in that interval. Uh, the eight, does that fall in that interval? No, it falls just outside. What about the zero? No. And so some of the values fall inside of the interval we created and some of them fall outside. It's just a matter of creating a percentage based off of what we observe, right? And if that percent is close to 68, then we move on to the next part of the process, which is to verify that the next interval is close to 95% and so on, all right? So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, well, I got five values out of the seven, all right? And I, I need some room here because I'm writing big and all that good stuff. So I'm gonna shrink dink just a little bit. So I have five out of the seven values that fall in that interval. So five out of seven. Do a quick division. That's about 71, 72% in that neighborhood. So I'm just gonna leave it in decimal form. At least get the, the, the three significant, uh, seven point, uh, 0.714. That's approximately 71%. All right. So if we're going to have a normal distribution, that first interval has to capture about 68% of the data. So then the question is, well, did it? Well, let's go back to the definition. Approximately 68% of the data, the approximate gives us a, a little wiggle room. It gives us two percentage points in either direction, right? So not close enough because that would give us anywhere between 66 and 70%, all right? So I'll just make a note of that here. So between 66 and 70%, including the wiggle room. Uh, 90, uh, the 95, you got two percentage points of wiggle room. So that's 93 and 97. So if the percent you come up with is in that, in that interval, in that, in that neighborhood, then you've satisfied the criteria, but you have to satisfy all three criteria, otherwise criterion. Uh, in order to make this work, and we did, we didn't even satisfy the first one. So this is not going to be a normal distribution. But I'll I'll take you through the second, um, the second standard deviation, just to, just so you get a feel for it. But you wouldn't have to do that on an assessment, right? Um, for three standard deviations, you got ninety nine point seven percent with wiggle room. So ninety five point uh, ninety seven point seven. Light up the. And you can't go over 100% in this context. There are certain circumstances where you can go over 100%. But when you're collecting items, once you have all of them, then, then that's it. You know, so you, you max out at 100%. All right. So looking at two standard deviations about the mean. So we didn't, we didn't satisfy the first criteria, uh, first part of the criteria. So, but. So the question here is uh, the number line is, is a little bit of an issue. So I'm, that's what I'm going to go over again. So let's let's see if uh, another look at it will help. All right. So we have values again that span from zero to eight in the original data set. All right. So zero to eight, because two, three, six, three, six, eight, zero, lowest value zero, highest value is eight, right? In the interval that we came up with for two standard deviations of the mean, the lowest number was a negative value, right? So I now, I now need to include some negative values. And the highest value is a little bit north of nine. 
So I want to get a, a number line that's going to encompass all of this information. So if I make my number line go from negative two and all the way up to 10, that'll, that'll get the job done. So zero, two, four, six, eight, and 10. Now it's a freehand graph, so it's perfectly all right if you um, if you're a little off with your tick marks and everything like that. You know, when you make a graph for your own purposes, as freehand as you want, as as sloppy as you want, that's all good. It's when you when you're making one for me that you want to take the extra time, right? So what I'm going to do first, after after I did that part of it, is I'm now going to create the benchmarks. So negative 1.5 and change. That's going to plot right about, yeah. So I'm going to, I'll label that negative 1.538. And then nine and change is going to plot right about, yeah. So this is the interval that we care about, right? That corresponds with the two standard deviations about the mean. That's this, this whole umbrella concept, is two standard deviations about the mean. We did all this work so that we could come up with that interval on the number line, all right? So what I'm then gonna do is look at the original data set and plot those points and see where they fall. And in that process, I'm gonna count up the numbers that fall inside of that bracketed off area and divide it by the total number of values in the set. And when I do that, I'm then gonna come up with a percentage. If that percentage is close enough to 95, then I will have satisfied this part of the criteria, right? So. First number is two, that plots here. Then we have three, six, back to three, another six, an eight, and then a zero. All right, and so here you can see that all of these values are captured within the bracketed off area every single one of them. None of them are outside of the boundary that we created based off our computations. So I'm looking at, uh, I already forgot how many values, there are seven, seven out of seven, and that's equal to 100% because I'm asking what percent fall in the bracketed area, all right, out of the total number of values that are available. Right, so you can see in the previous one, not all of them fell in that bracketed area. Only five of them fell in the bracketed area. So we got 71%, right? So these numbers are kind of sort of getting, they're, they're sort of close to those normal distribution percentages, but they're not close enough to, to be categorized as giving us a data set that is distributed normally. All right, so that, that's the key ingredient here. And that's what makes everything either work or not work, right? And, you know, we're going to talk in more detail about why things ought to be a normal distribution or, you know, it's like what's the value of uh, something being a normal distribution. That, that's, that's a different conversation for a different day. But, um, but there, there, there's a, a very, very good justification for why we're doing this. And it, it's kind of like um, statistics will be broken if normal distributions didn't really exist, these concepts, right? Um, the last one, we could do the work, but, and, and, and like I said, I preface this whole thing by saying the number line business is, is only necessary if you need the visual, right? If you can look at the data that we have and look at the interval that we, that we developed and say, Oh yeah, none of those values fall in that interval, or, or or all of them fall in that interval. Then you're already done. You don't need to draw a picture. But the the visual helps. It's helped a lot of people in the past, so I kind of gravitate towards that. 
right? So, you know, if you just kind of talk it out to yourself and say, well, okay, my lowest number in my interval is negative 4.3, the highest number is around 12. Well, all my entire data set is between zero and eight. So they're all gonna be in that interval. So this is gonna capture all of the values, seven out of seven, then you wouldn't even have to create the, uh, the number line and go from there. Also, since the interval, and, and this is probably more important, since the interval keeps getting wider, if you look at it, it's separated by about seven units for the one standard deviation about the mean. I don't know why I'm pointing at the screen as if you can see what I'm pointing at, but it, it's separated by about seven or eight units. Actually, not even, uh, like five and a half units. I was treating that one as if it was negative. Um, so one standard deviation is separated by about five units then two standard deviations separated by about 11 units, and then three standard deviations separated by over 16 units. So the interval is getting wider and wider and wider. So once you capture 100% of the data, if you were only going to expand the interval, then you already have the data. So what, what are you going to gain? You can't gain more than what's already there. It's kind of like if I were to, if I were to guess uh, the ages of the people in the class. And, and, and really this kind of ties in sort of nicely. If I were to say, all right, raise your hand. We're in a regular in-person class. I say, raise your hand if your age is between uh, 15 and 30. And you know, people raise their hand, but a few, uh, you, you know, a couple of folks don't, right? And then I expand the interval and I say, uh, okay, how about between 10 and 35, right? Most people raise their hand. There's still a few that haven't, right? So then I expand it to from 10 to 50, right? Everybody but one raises their hand. Then I make it uh, 10 to 60. Everybody but one raises their hand. And I'm like, you know what? Let me go the other way. Nine to 60. Now everybody raises their hand, right? So now I have everybody. Would it make sense afterwards if I were to say, okay, now raise your hand if you're between if the ages between five and 75? You're like, dude, what are, you, what are you doing? You already got us all. You don't have to keep giving us more possibilities. You, you, you already got what you needed. You don't have to expand the interval anymore. You, you've already captured everything, right? That's what's happening here between two standard deviations and three standard deviations. All right, so it's, it's always boiling down to that. Once you get to 100, you're at 100. So then what we do, again, is we look at the benchmarks that we developed before between 66 and 70, that's a no. Between 93 and 97, that's a no. The last one is a yeah, but the damage is already done. It has to, be, it has to work for all three. You gotta have a check mark for all three each one of these percentages has to line up appropriately. So that if, if that 71 was a 70, we would have been fine. Then we would have had to look at the two standard deviations and that still would have been too far. So this is not a normal distribution. Is that the final answer? Yep. Okay. All right. And so you can see hopefully that this is all reliant on what the mean and standard deviation are, right? Because all of these calculations, they all start, we got the X bar plus the minus a one, two and three S, but if X bar and S are different, we're gonna get different intervals because we have different data values. We're gonna get different percentages. Sometimes we're gonna have normal distributions and sometimes we won't, right? And so that, that's a critical piece to understanding uh, relationships and statistics. It's, it's knowing when a data set is a normal distribution. Now, okay, now that we know that, what can we do with it? Again, different conversation for a different day, but very meaningful stuff, right? So that's, that's like the beefiest question in the unit. Um, It, it really doesn't get, in this unit, I would say, it really doesn't get any more challenging than that. So that, that's, that's great news.
Uh, well, okay, so it's news, but it's it's not it's not terrible news because if you handle if you can handle that one, then you're good. If you can't, then at least you know what you got to work towards. All right. So we're going to skip again. We're going to skip the frequency tables for now. We will come back and get them because it's a vital part of statistics. You can't just, you just can't skip. It's like skipping addition. And if you're in el elementary school, it's just not, you just can't do that, you know. Um, but we're, we're going to jump and talk about Z scores. And after that, we'll talk uh, tech assignment and then uh, I'll get you going. Um, so this is the last thing we're going to talk about tonight. It's the, uh, or at least it's part of the lecture, the Z scores. Uh, standardized score used for comparing the standard deviations of two or more data sets. Okay. So it's a definition, you know, and, and just like every other math class, it's like, okay, you're given a definition. Now we got to work to understand what the heck that definition is asking us to do. All right. So if you look at the formulas, uh, you could ignore the subscripts. Uh, I, I got a little overzealous. I, those subscripts are appropriate notation, but they were, I, I typed up for a different class and I copied and pasted in here and I just forgot to change it. So those little eyes, you can just get rid of those. They don't need to be there. I, um, I don't make too many people happy when I do this, but I can just do it like that and everything's all good, but, but yeah. Um, also, we're gonna be focusing just on the first formula because the second one is related to material that we cover in the second unit but it makes sense to talk about it, or at least uh, have it on paper somewhere. So we're looking at this formula right now, All right? So, so we're looking at Z equals X minus X bar over S, right? So X minus X bar gives us a deviation from the mean, right? So it's the distance every score is away from the mean, right? So that's, that's a deviation. By dividing it by S, we're measuring that deviation in terms of how many standard deviations uh, we are away from that mean. So it's kind of like um, if I were to tell you that my height is 75 inches, all right? But then I tell you the relationship that's, that 12 inches is one foot, then what do you do? You take the 75 and divide it by 12 to do that conversion, right? So the only thing that you're ever waiting on when you're computing a Z-score is the definition of the conversion, and that comes from whatever the standard deviation is, right? So that, that's the part where you have to compute. You're, you're not waiting on somebody to tell you that. You have to compute that on your own. So it's kind of like, you know, we're still talking about inches and feet, except the, 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 def, the relationship between inches and feet is constantly changing. All right, so if that were the case, what would you do? You'd have to wait on whatever the new relationship is, right? So, but that, that's, uh, you know, the, the theory behind it. In practice, it's computation. If you know the X, the X bar and the S, you can easily compute the Z-score, right? So here's the example. Mike and Jane are in different classes. Mike's got a score of 75. Jane's got a score of 73. Uh, the mean in Michael's class is 73 with a standard deviation of 7.2. James' class uh, mean was 71, standard deviation of 6.3. Who scored better relative to their classes? All right, key term here, relative to their classes. So the relative term being the key term, All right? Because we already know who scored better. This goes back to what I was talking about before, where the, the one one person got a 70 on a test and walking around like a champ and you're like, why, 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 why do you, why do you think you're so hot here? He's like, well, I, everybody else failed, right? Okay. Uh, we know Michael did better than Jane. He got a 75, she got a 73. But based off of the mean and standard deviation, we can start to get a sense of in what way he performed better or maybe he didn't perform better at all, right? So we have Michael, And we have his metrics, X, his score 75, the class average, 
X bar 73 with an S value of 7.2. All right, so we could figure out the Z score for Michael just by doing 75 minus 73 divided by 7.2. So just some quick number crunching. I'm just going to get rid of some of these calculations. I got a lot of them. Uh, so 75 minus 73. Well, that's two. I didn't really need to do that. Divided by 7.2. That part I need. Uh, I think that's an anyway. Two divided by 7.2. So about 0.278. So then we have Jane. And her information is that she got 73 on the test. Her mean, her class's mean was a 71. And her class's standard deviation was a 6.3. So same formula, same skill, different result. So 73 minus 71 is still going to be 2. So he was 2 points better than average. She was 2 points better than average. But based off of the standard deviation, we get a z-score of 0.317. The benefit of being able to compute z-scores is now we can take two individuals from two different data sets and we can compare them on the same ruler, right? So we can now say, all right, because we're standardizing. We can say we got a number line. Zero is the case where they're both average. All right, so that would be the average value. So if Jane's score was exactly the same as the mean, then she would have a z-score of zero. All right, same thing with Michael. All right. But this is, this is essentially a number line. So we're going to have different steps here in each direction. One, two, three, negative one, negative two, negative three. Now, where they fall on this number line, because we standardize it so that we don't have to think about standard deviations anymore. We're just thinking about these numbers on an ordinary number line. So 0.278. I don't know precisely where that is, but I know it's going to be somewhere close to zero. That's Michael. All right. Then we have 0.317. Again, I don't know where that is precisely, but it's definitely to the right of where Michael's score was. All right, so on this number line, you have two individuals who didn't do a whole lot better than the class average, but Jane is a smidge further to the right than, than Michael is. And what that tells us is that Jane performed better relative to her class. Right now, again, it's uh, we're looking at this at this point as a moral victory because neither of them are bragging, and you know, like it's it's that whole seventy analogy before. If you get a seventy, it's a C on your transcript. It's like, all right, cool. You everybody else in your class failed. You got the highest score. Congratulations. I'm sure you feel wonderful. It's still a C. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, yeah, I got a ninety-five. Everybody else in my class got a 98 or 100. Yeah, I'm the worst in my class, but an A's an A, pal. I don't know what to tell you. You know, so it's, I don't know what to tell you, no matter how you slice it. But Jane, in our conclusion here, performed better relative to her class. On an assessment, I don't go looking to take off points for frivolous reasons. 
Uh, but if you, when you come across a question like this on the test, you're gonna you're gonna have to answer in verbal form something along the lines of like, all right, so what happened? You know, who who performed better, Jane or Chris? If you just say Jane performed better, that's incorrect. She did not perform better. She got two points less than Chris did. Chris, geez. Uh, that was the question on the last test. Uh, Michael, all right. She did not perform better. Michael performed better. All right. But if I say Jane performed better relative to her class, now it's a true state. All right. So it's something to bear in mind. Yeah, it's a little bit on the particular side, but it's also very meaningful stuff. And uh, it, we're still kind of living in the realm of, you know, like textbooky type problems. You know, not very real world, although everybody can relate to scores in a, uh, on, a, on a test in a math class. But, it, you know, like we want to dive deep into the, the, the real, real world stuff. And Question. so in order to do that, we need to understand this stuff. Question? Yes. Um, I, as I can recall, I don't see where in nursing we need um, statistics. Do we need statistics? Uh, in nursing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty much every aspect of nursing and statistics. Yeah, I, that's, that's, uh, that's, the one, that's the one profession where I know it's going to come up repeatedly. The, the computational skills, the, uh, the margin for error, uh, dosages and um, understanding, um, the breakdown of medication in the system and uh, like timing. You know when you can take a medicine and, and you know like when you're when you're ready to take the next dose that's all statistics based like for example uh the simple the, the simple example off the top of my head is um like why do you take why can't you take tylenol more than once every four hours or six hours or whatever it is and you know the simple answer is well you got to get it out of your system well what what does that mean you know so the calculus of it is that there's a rate of change associated with the breakdown of the medicine within your system. So it's, it's dissolved and absorbed into the bloodstream and it decays over time and has a certain half-life. And so what happens is you have, depending on your physiology, you have somewhere between this and that, you know, in terms of a, a period of time for which you are still under that influence of whatever that medication is. So if the dosage chart says that an individual can take it once every five hours, but you know that that person has um, uh, you know, chronic uh, low blood pressure and they're also underweight, then you're, you're looking at the, the, um, the, the, the lower end of whatever interval you're talking about in terms of the, the period of time in which a person would be ready or able to take their next dose of the medication, right? So uh, that, that's just one example, but it comes up, uh, it comes up repeatedly. Um, I, and, and you know, like it, it's kind of crazy because I'm not, I'm not a nurse myself, but I, uh, I have a lot of family and friends that are all nurses and they get those tech, uh, you know, the nursing journals that come in the mail. I forget what the, the name of it is, but almost every one of them is a statistical analysis. You look at the, uh, the reports on, uh, not reports, commercials on TV when they're talking about medication and they're saying, you know, a small percentage of people have reported the symptoms, you know, and then they list all of them and they're like, that's all statistics based. So the medication part of it, um, Computational skills is always just a, a, at a minimum, but the medication part of it is huge. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, yeah. So anyway, uh, that that was uh, that, I mean, it was real world as a guess, I guess. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording on this. Um, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, uh, up there where it says like the Z score. And there's um, two equations or whatever, um, and says one or the other. Um, are those other symbols the same? Like the weird uh, U thing, is that the same as the X bar symbol? It means the same thing? Same idea, just for a population rather than a sample. 
Okay. Right? So we're, we're going to talk about that in the second unit. But it, it really, it's, it's kind of a placeholder for the same kind of information, just in a different context. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, 